In January of 2018, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released the report of a congressionally mandated study of the Department of Veterans Affairs Mental Health Treatment. In this study, it was found that about half of veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan who may have a need for mental health care services don't use any mental health care services either in the VA or outside the VA. A large proportion of veterans do not receive any treatment following the diagnosis of PTSD, substance use disorders, or depression, and more than half of the veterans who have a need for mental health care services don't think that they need it. Many veterans don't know that they could benefit from mental health counseling, and those that do know don't access it. Some do, right before it's too late, and some don't, and then it becomes too late. That's a problem that I want to try to solve. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a retired Army non-commissioned officer, combat veteran, and clinical mental health counselor. I'm the creator of the Headspace and Timing blog, which can be found at VeteranMentalHealth.com, and the host of the Headspace and Timing podcast, a show on the Change Your POV podcast network. I have a unique perspective on the specific challenges that veterans experience upon returning from war. I've studied it, I've lived it, and I've helped the veterans sustain their strengths while improving their weaknesses. There are several reasons why this problem exists. The military culture is one of readiness and apparent strength. The stigma against seeking support exists both internally, the veteran is against it, and externally, the community or peer group is against it. Veterans are concerned that they'll be labeled and branded if they seek mental health care, and that the things they value will be taken away, rights, freedom, employment. The most significant problem is a lack of awareness. Veterans, their family members, and those who support veterans are unaware of the comprehensive impact of veteran mental health. Let me introduce you to the concept of comprehensive veteran mental health. In the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through all of the aspects of veteran mental health, the ones that go beyond just PTSD and TBI. When I ask people what is the single largest problem that veterans are struggling with when it comes to mental health, I hear a variety of things. Suicide, transitioning, coming home, etc. Those aren't specific problems, though. They're more like results or situations. Sooner rather than later, though, people say PTSD. What else, I ask? What's another mental health challenge other than PTSD that veterans face? Very quickly, many say TBI, traumatic brain injury. Absolutely. Both of these mental health conditions have emerged over the last 50 years as significant conditions that veterans face, especially combat veterans. Then I ask, what about substance abuse? Yeah, okay, we know the military drinks, drunk as a sailor and all that. And they're right. I had a mentor tell me one time that there's an 80% comorbidity rate with a substance use and another mental health condition. 80% of the veterans with PTSD, TBI, or any of the other things that I'm going to talk about are also able to be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. It's more than just alcohol, though. Prescription drug abuse is as significant in the military as it is in the non-military population. Prescriptions to pick you up, prescriptions to calm you down, and if those aren't available, use the non-prescription equivalent. And the opioid crisis that the VA is dealing with starts in the DOD. But what else? There's an element of emotional dysregulation that's separate from PTSD. Anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, anger, fear. There are unique military circumstances that can cause this. Learned helplessness, lack of adjustment, response to situations. Although there is an emotional component to PTSD, and TBI can impact how you manage and regulate emotions, we should look at non-traumatic emotional dysregulation as a separate issue. Many of the veterans I work with find that they have a lack of purpose and meaning after they leave the service. They were once somebody and now they're nobody. One week they're on top of the world and the next week they're just a regular guy or gal. Serving the military is a profession. It changes the individual's identity. They become something different from what they were. While not all veterans struggle with PTSD, most veterans struggle with how to find something meaningful in their post-military lives. There's a new concept that has emerged in the last 30 years called moral injury with much discussion and research about it in the last 15. PTSD is an injury of the behavior, a conditioned response to a particular stimulus. This response is neurological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral, but something in the veteran's environment triggers something in the veteran's brain. Traumatic brain injury, by comparison, is a physical injury to the brain. Moral injury can be described as an injury of the soul. A veteran's core belief about what is right and wrong in the world has changed, sometimes in a large way and sometimes in a small way. This can happen through exposure to traumatic events like PTSD. It can happen due to betrayal from a trusted individual, someone else committing acts of brutality or betrayal. Or it could 
be the veteran's own shame or guilt about acts they committed or things they could not or did not stop. Another challenge is that when a veteran leaves the service, they no longer know how to meet their needs in the same way they used to. In the military, their structure and support, the basic needs of shelter, food, security are provided. Social needs are also provided in the form of the team or unit. After leaving the service, some veterans struggle with meeting their needs. They're unable to find employment or maintain housing. They're not familiar with how to make the changes necessary to get their needs met. Some struggle and ultimately succeed. Some struggle and fail. Finally, another area that veterans need to pay attention to after the service is their relationships. Family systems, not just intergenerationally as in spouses and peers, but intergenerationally like parents and children. Without addressing these areas, undesirable things start to happen. Isolation and disengagement with PTSD, overdose with substance abuse, emotional pain, apathy, guilt and shame, frustration, divorce, and domestic violence, seizures, suicide. Further complicating matters is the medical model of mental health. These four areas, there's a diagnosis for each one of them. I can look them up in a book and provide a code for it. Insurance pays for it. Service-connected disability is provided for them. There are medications that can be prescribed. Some work well, others not so much. For these four areas, there is no diagnosis. There's no medicine. Insurance doesn't pay for them, but they are still very real and challenging for veterans to navigate. There are internal barriers that keep veterans from seeking help for these conditions. Internal stigma, the warrior ethos, suck it up and drive on. There are also external barriers to seeking help. Situations and systems have an impact on behavior. Society judgment, external stigma against help seeking. There are barriers to care, both systematically and economically. Peer judgment plays a role. And common stereotypes that many have of veterans. They're a victim, they're a villain, or they're a hero. This, then, is comprehensive veteran mental health. Any veteran wanting to live peaceful and satisfying post-military life must understand where they are in each of these areas and how to get help if they need it. How does a veteran know? Many times it'll come out of some of the indicators we saw earlier, but the mental health community is uniquely positioned to provide support. For each of these areas, there are proven assessments and interventions that we know works. The clinician-administered PTSD scale and the trauma screening inventory can be used to determine the presence of PTSD symptoms. And we know for certain that prolonged exposure and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing works for PTSD, if that's the primary problem that the veteran is struggling with. The Defense and Veterans Brain Injury Center has great screening tools to determine the presence of a TBI, and neuropsychological screenings are excellent diagnostic tools as well as interventions, neurofeedback, and cognitive restructuring show great promise. There are very effective assessments to determine the presence of a substance use disorder, such as the Substance Abuse Subtle Screening Inventory and the Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. Again, there are interventions that are known to work, like motivational interviewing and relapse prevention. There are a number of assessments that can determine if a veteran is struggling with emotional dysregulation, such as depression, anger, and anxiety. Cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy are both excellent interventions to impact emotional conditions. Screenings such as a life satisfaction survey are good instruments to be able to determine a level of the veteran's satisfaction with their current life circumstances, and existential approaches used to help the veteran explore their need for purpose and meaning can be very effective. Screening tools such as the Expression of Moral Injury Survey Military, the Moral Injury Event Scale Military, and the Moral Injury Questionnaire Military can help determine the presence of potentially morally injurious events. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy and Adaptive Disclosure are each interventions that help veterans come to terms with moral injury. Questionnaires such as the Military to Civilian Questionnaire can provide insight into a veteran's level of comfort with their military transition, and again, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy and Choice Theory are helpful in supporting the veteran through this transition. And finally, assessments like the Family Satisfaction Scale and others can uncover a veteran's current level of functioning in the family system, and family systems theory can support readjustment after combat in the military. So, if something can be measured, then it can be quantified. The results of these assessments can determine if a veteran is functioning well or fairly well, if they're struggling in one or more of these areas, or if they're operating at a deficit in some of them. In my experience, the more areas that a veteran is functional in, the more stable they will be, and the better their post-military life will be.
And the more areas that a veteran is not functional in, the worse their post-military life is going to be. Let's look at me as an example. I retired from the Army in 2014, have not experienced a period of unemployment since my retirement, and have service-connected disability because I jumped out of too many airplanes too many times. I have five combat and operational deployments, but only two of them were significant in terms of danger and exposure to combat. In regards to my PTSD, I'd put myself about here. I do have triggers, and there are some things that impact me, but they're few and far between, and I pretty much have a handle on it. I've thankfully never experienced a TBI. I've been knocked unconscious and had my bell rung several times, but I've never developed TBI symptoms, nor noticed any challenges in that regard. With substance abuse, I'm pretty good. I don't drink alcohol to mask psychological or emotional pain. I don't engage in dangerous substance use behavior. At one point, early in my career, I was all the way down here, but I've definitely gotten control of it. When it comes to emotion regulation, I'd say I'm about here. I struggle with depression and anxiety sometimes, and yes, my anger can crop up. The main thing is, I'm aware of it, and I'm actively managing it. For meaning and purpose, I'm certainly good here. I found something in my post-military life that gives me as much, if not more, meaning and purpose than I had in the military. With moral injury, I'd say I'm about here. There are things that I regret from my time in service, guilt that I carry, or frustration about how some things were done. Again, though, I'm aware of it. When it comes to getting my needs met, I'm pretty good. I have a good job, my family is housed, clothed, and fed, and I'm generally satisfied with how my needs are being met. And with family systems, I've maintained my marriage and my relationship with my children. I'm good to go here, too. So as you can see, there are a couple of areas that are operating at less than peak performance, but these are only two out of eight. And anyone who goes to combat is going to be impacted by things like these, and they're not going to be 100% all across the board. Now let's consider someone who may not be doing quite so well. There might be a veteran who's struggling with PTSD symptoms. Either they haven't been diagnosed or they've been diagnosed but not treated. They could be experiencing traumatic brain injury symptoms. In order to cope with this, they turn to alcohol or other substances. In addition to TBI, substance use concerns, and untreated PTSD, there's a component of major depressive disorder. The veteran doesn't feel as though their life is as meaningful as it was in the service. They think back to a time when they meant something, when they're part of a team, and they simply don't understand what the point is anymore. They feel guilty about what happened while they were in, harbor resentment about the betrayal that led to the deaths of their brothers. They're unable to get a job, which means they can't afford housing or other basic necessities. What support they did have, they lost when they left the military, their spouses left them, taking the children, and they're truly alone. This, of course, is a recipe for disaster. So you may have some questions about all this. How do we know if we're in the green or in the red? What are the signs of veterans struggling? How do we find a mental health counselor to help a veteran we care for into services? If you're someone who's helping veterans, either in the employment space, the education space, or the recovery space, you may want to know how you can understand more. The first thing to do is follow some of the links accompanying this video. I have a series of blog posts and podcast episodes that directly talk to each of these areas. If you're in Colorado, I'd love to be able to talk to you in person. Veterans have a lot of choices when it comes to who to talk to and who to reach out to, and I can help you get connected to the right place. You have a lot of options when it comes to therapy, but I'm sure you'd rather go somewhere that understands your needs entirely, someplace that practices comprehensive veteran mental health. If you're not in Colorado Springs, reach out to me anyway. I've developed a nationwide network of mental health providers who understand the unique needs of veterans, and I'd be happy to connect you to them. Go to VeteranMentalHealth.com forward slash contact and we'll get you connected to where you need to go. The tragic truth is, we lost another veteran yesterday. They might have been young or old, combat, non-combat, but another veteran took their own life when help was available. This will be true on the day I create this, and it'll be true on the day you watch it. There is another truth. You're not alone, veterans. Ever. You have the ability to reach out for help and achieve the post-military life you really want. If you find this information valuable, we ask that you share it. Share it with your buddies, your network across all platforms. The only way we're going to get ahead of this thing is to bring it out of the darkness and into the light. When you do share it, use the veteran mental health hashtag, and maybe you can help a veteran in the most important way possible. You can help them help themselves. Thank you.